We live, we love, we serve. Call to live, commanded to love, commissioned to serve. And if that's too much, what, we, what do we say here? We live, oh, we love, we serve. That's what we do. Amen, amen. We live, we love, we serve. If you will remain standing, our scripture for today comes from the book of John, chapter 8, verse 30, verses 31 and 32. I'm going to read it in the NRSV, and then I'm going to read it in the Message Bible. Again, John, chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Jesus then said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In the Message Bible, it reads, Then Jesus turned to the Jews who had claimed to believe in him. If you stick with this, living out what I tell you, you are my disciples for sure. Then you will experience for yourselves the truth, and the truth will free you. Let's pray. God of liberty, freedom, and wholeness, we thank you today in advance for the shackles that will be broken, for the freedom that will ensue for the way in which some of us will go from just living life to living life abundantly. God, we don't want to merely survive in this world. We want to thrive. Help us, God. Show us. We thank you for the word that you are imparting on today. We thank you that we will receive each and every one of us what is needed and necessary today. We won't look at the messenger, but we will hear directly what you are speaking to our hearts. Jesus said, he and she who have ears, let them hear. Let us be hearers today of what you wish to say to us, God. We love you. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. I bet if I took a poll in here right now and I asked you how many of us believe that we are honest people, most of us, I think, would raise our hands. And then if I asked again how many of us believe that we are truthful people, most of us would probably raise our hand. And then some of you might look at me like I was a little crazy because you were like, what is the difference between honesty and truth? And even though we use those words interchangeably, they have vastly different definitions. Now, what is the difference (laughs) between honesty and truth? To be honest means that you express your opinions and your feelings accurately. That you express your feelings and your opinions accurately. It's really about not lying. It's about telling the truth. It's about a state of integrity, right? But truth are the facts about a situation, event, or a person. They are an accurate representation of reality. You can be honest about something, but it still not be true. And I didn't always understand that. And I remember being in therapy and my therapist told me, well, does your feelings are not facts. Your feelings are valid. They are warranted. They are welcomed. But just because you feel it doesn't make it a fact. And I was like, how can that be true? Because if I'm experiencing this thing, and it seems real, and it looks real, and it's my experience, how can that not be true? But the reality is that our relationship with the truth is tricky. 
As humans, we innately do things to protect ourselves instinctively, even if it means we lie to ourselves. We will do that biologically to protect us from things that we feel might be harmful to us. Have you ever been around someone who was just delusional? And I don't mean in like a mental health crisis way. I mean like they believe in their lies and what they are saying so, so real and vividly that to them it is the truth, even though the evidence suggests otherwise, right? You're like, what is happening? Some of us so rightfully, rightly and confidently believe that what we're saying is correct. They may be being honest. It is their truth, but it is not the truth. And that's really, really hard for some of us to kind of take in because if we've lived long enough with certain truths, and things that we believe, oftentimes it takes an external confrontation for us to kind of wake up to reality. I'm kind of thinking about the movie, The Matrix. And if you think about the main character, Neo, he thought The Matrix was real. He thought that was the experience and it was not until he had an external confrontation that he realized that what he thought was reality and what he thought he was truth was not. And we say we want the truth, but we aren't always ready for its arrival and its confrontation. It's 2017, and I'm sitting across from Pastor Mike in a meeting, struggling, and he gave me permission to tell this story. <laughs> and I'm sitting across from him in a meeting, struggling, and I was sinking under the weight of everything that I was holding and I was sinking fast. The girls were like six months old, I was a newlywed, work was just a lot and I was having a really hard time keeping it together and I just wanted to rest, I just wanted a lifeline and when I opened up my mouth to say something to him, three words fell out, I am drowning. I am drowning, that was my truth. I was drowning. And I don't remember everything that happened in that conversation, but I do know a few months later, I was back in his office and we were having the same conversation. And after some back and forth, I said, but Pastor Mike, I told you that I was drowning. And he looked at me and he said, Des, I know that you told me that you were drowning, but I didn't believe you because you drowned so well. <laughs> I didn't believe you because you drowned so well. And wasn't really the response I was expecting to get. You know, in my mind, I was going to get something that felt a bit more supportive and I was really frustrated at the time about it because I felt like so many of us run around trying to be super men and super women so we suffer in silence we don't say what we need we don't articulate what was happening and here I did I opened up my mouth I felt like I was uh, screaming at the top of my lungs and what came out wasn't believed and that was painful because what do you do when you say what you need and it's not taken seriously? And I, I didn't really know what to do with that and I was pretty deflated. I couldn't figure out how I was flailing in the water looking like a fish on land and somehow it looked like beautiful synchronous water choreography <laughs> to him. I, I couldn't figure it out. But there's this thing called instinctive drowning response. It happens when you are very close to drowning. It's when you are attempting to stay above water so that you can breathe, and so you're spending so much time trying to breathe, it's to the exclusion of getting effort to get help or to self-rescue. And the thing about instinctive drowning response is to an untrained observer, it's not obvious you were drowning. 
So you're drowning, but oftentimes you may see someone in the water and you think that they're playing or they're good or everything is okay. And because their head is above water, you do not recognize that they are actually drowning. I was drowning, but he couldn't recognize it. And I left angry. And I was angry for a long, long, long time. But here's the reality. When we are confronted with the truth, we respond in many ways. And often how we respond depends on how, the when, the what, and the who. Because all of those things assault our human fragility and determine whether we can hear what's actually being said. So sometimes, if we don't like the how of what someone says it, we dismiss it because we don't like their tone or we don't like their tenor, but it doesn't mean that it's not truth. Sometimes we ignore something that is said to us if it comes when we are not ready to deal with it. But just because we are not ready to deal with it doesn't mean that it's not the truth. Sometimes we turn a blind eye to something because it touches a deep wound, but just because it touches the thing doesn't mean that it's not truth. And sometimes we discard what we are told because we don't like the messenger. But just because we don't like the person giving the message doesn't mean that it's not true. And in hindsight, I was not ready for the truth that was presented with, to me because the reality was that I did drown well. And it took me years, years to confront those words again. And maybe I probably only confronted them because I was still drowning. But when I did, I recognized that I had ver heard versions of that statement all my life, shrouded in compliments. See, when you are a high-performing person with a lot of capacity, people don't always see your pain and your struggle. So even when you are not functioning optimally, you are still functioning better than most at their fullest. And so what happens is, I've heard things like, and you may have heard these too, well, your 50% is better than someone else's 100%. Anybody? I don't know how you do it all. Anybody? I hear that one like once a week at least. You make it look so, oh, you know that one. You make it look so easy. And if I'm honest, at times, I probably wore that as a badge of honor, that I could do so much, and that it looked easy. But the reality was, it was not easy. And my body was failing me. I was drowning. I was moving, but I wasn't getting anywhere fast because my arms were flaccid and I was taking in tons of water and I didn't know how to stop. I just finished reading this book by Natalie Liu called The Joy of Saying No. A really good book, The Joy of Saying No by Natalie Liu. And she says this, the body doesn't like conflict and lies. It needs you to tell the truth so that you can be okay and well. Appearing as if what you do doesn't bother or hurt you or take as much effort as it does or that you are without needs means people have no idea you're drowning, all while you might feel unseen and unheard. It takes a toll when what you project and portray on the outside is at odds with how you feel on the inside. And so even though those words hurt me at the time, I also had to recognize that I had partial responsibility for why it was hard to believe that I was drowning. It was honest that I was drowning, but it was also truth that I drowned well. I did have an unconscious habit of making it look easier than it was, but my body could no longer hold that truth. 
So I went on a little journey emotionally. And I tried to go back and remember when I began to give the appearance that I could swim well to my own detriment. So can I admit something to you all? I have a complicated relationship with the water. I grew up in Oceanside, California, known for its piers, its beaches, and its frequent Ike Turner sightings. But I have only been to the beach up until the age of 18 a handful of times. One, because like I just cannot stand sand. It gets everywhere, and honestly, like I feel like sand is boot, uh, glitter's bootleg cousin with no personality. Like I can't do the sand, but also I can't swim, right? And you, when you're a black girl, you, kinda, you can kind of get it, you know, they don't think we can swim anyway. So I couldn't swim, and because I couldn't swim, I didn't trust the water. And I would go to the beach and I'm like, I don't know how deep it is. I don't know what's in there. I'm not touching it. I don't need to be near the water and the water don't need to be near me. But that all changed in the sixth grade. I was a part of this Christian club called Awanas. Does anyone know? You know Awanas, I knew somebody knew Awanas. I don't know if they had, do they have Awanas in New York? Oh, Awanas stood for approved workmen are not ashamed. And Awanas was like this Christian club that you went to weekly and you got badges and trophies and vests for knowing all the Bible scriptures and going through your book. And in Oceanside, California, there were only a handful of black people in Awanas. It was like me, my brother, my sister, my best friend Megan, her brother Brandon, and a sprinkle of people. But Awanas had a camp in the summer. And my mom decided that I could go to camp. And I wanted to go to camp because I wanted to see Rashad. <laughs> and this year was the year that I was going to make Rashad fall in love with me. So I go to camp. And everyone's in the pool, including Rashad. I told you I can't swim, right? And so I get in the pool. And I'm like, cool, I'll just stay cute on the shallow side. But Rashad is out in the deep. So I decide I'm going I'm to try to inch towards it. And you know when you can't, you know how you start and your feet are like firmly planted on the bottom of the pool. But at some point, you know you end up on your tippy toes and you know you're in trouble if the water starts hitting the back of your scalp and your kitchen starts curling up, right? So I got there and I realized I was in danger, Will Robinson. I'm in a little bit of trouble. And I decided I was going to try to get back. Like, well, maybe this isn't the way, Rashad. I was trying to get back to the shallow, but there was a big slide that separated the shallow side from the deep side. So as I'm trying to get back to the shallow side, a whole bunch of kids come down the slide and pile on top of me. So now I am actually literally drowning. There are kids on, on, on top of me. I can't get out. I cannot swim. I'm panicked. I'm underwater. I'm choking. I'm taking in all of this water and nobody notices for a while. By the time they noticed it, I am embarrassed. I am undone. My hair is undone. And I am like Rashad is surely not going to love me now. And I made a, a decision in that moment. I was never going to drown again. I was never gonna, I was never gonna be caught slipping again. And so because we couldn't afford lessons, I decided that I was gonna teach myself how to swim. And I did in our little, the pool at my school, I learned how to swim, well, swim adjacent, right? If, if, Swimming means I can like jump in on either side. I can swim underneath, kind of cute. I can swim over, but I'm only okay if I keep moving. I am only okay if I keep moving. <laughs> I couldn't really tread water or float, but as long as I was moving, I gave the appearance that I was doing well. But I never learned to trust the water and I didn't care because I just didn't want to to drown 
And in recalling that story, I saw what had become the truth of my life. I had convinced myself that I was swimming well and that I was good as long as I kept moving. And I kept swimming even though I was tired because I didn't want to drown. The most common way that people drown is because they don't really know how to swim. And even those who profess to be good swimmers can drown for many reasons. One, they're overconfident in their abilities. Two, because they are presumed to swim well, they are less likely to be watched or supervised. Three, because they don't think that drowning is a possibility. Four, because they take more risks because they think they're safe. Five, because they swim too long. A lot of us are drowning because one, we're overconfident in our abilities and that looks like saying, I can do it all. Two, because we are presumed to swim well and we are less likely to be watched or supervised. You've seen that thing check on your strong friends. When you're the strong one, the high performing one, the cut function, people don't always check on you so you're not being supervised well. And so you figure like you have to go it alone no matter what. Three, because we don't think that drowning is a possibility that looks like I've got this, I can figure it out, I'm good, I'm fine. Four, we take on more risks because we think we're safe. That looks like continuing to add more onto our plates, onto our backs, like sacrificial mules even though it is clear that we are sinking in five because we swim too long trying to keep up with our goals with our expectations with others even when our body is giving out we are supposed to take breaks in swimming we are supposed to float and tread water but like I said I never learned how to accurately tread or float so I just kept swimming with no land in sight. We drown spiritually, emotionally, relationally. And I thought I was drowning under the weight of like my to-do lists and everything that I had to do, but the reality was I was drowning, sputtering, coughing, thrashing, because I was trying to function in a way I had always functioned. But what I have recognized and am recognizing because it is a current process is that I had to change my relationship with the water. The water is often compared to be truth in the Bible. And I had to change my relationship with the truth that was confronting me in my life. It says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free translates in the um, New Testament to liberty. That means to be free within a society from restrictions imposed on one's life or behavior. In this capitalistic society where it tells you you are only valuable by what you produce, we are told that we have to keep going, that we have to keep swimming, that we have to monetize everything, even our hobbies, and we grind ourselves into the ground. Society tells you that you have to keep swimming. It doesn't teach you how to trust the water. And even though some of us are more buoyant than others, the reality is that we all have the capacity to float. That we all have the capacity to gently rest in the ebb and the flow of the water. And Jesus was always trying to get us to the truth. He even pointed to himself as being the truth. He tells the woman at the well that in order to worship, you must worship in spirit and in truth. And Jesus' truth was countercultural to what was happening around him. Some of us need to learn how to rest in the water. Some of us think and we're finding 
that we're continuing to swim, we're continuing to go, we're continuing to grind, we're continuing to push, and the results are not coming the way we want, or they are, but we are tired. We don't want to do it anymore. We want to stop. We want to break. But really, we have trained ourselves to keep going. We have trained other people to always put more on us, and we don't know how to stop to not always be moving. And that moment, that conversation, helps me recognize something. That I had the capacity to save myself. Right, I went into that conversation because I wanted Pastor Mike to provide something that would help me not drown. And he kept looking at me kind of flabbergasted because he was kind of like, well, Des, I mean, you, I mean, you create your own work schedule and you, I'm not a micromanager and you, you basically have the ability to do what is necessary. But I had abdicated my choice. And that's what many of us often do. We act as if we don't have a choice in the situations that we are in. I was acting as if I was drowning and I had no responsibility in it. But the reality was I was drowning because I had bad and porous boundaries and I didn't know how to say no when I was trying to please people and I thought I had to do everything and I didn't know how to ask for help and I didn't know how to say I needed to rest or that needed a break. I didn't understand that no was a complete sentence, that I didn't have to explain myself if I didn't want to do something. I didn't understand that being self-care was not selfish. There was nothing that he could offer me because I was the one both with the life vest and putting the, the weights on my ankles. And so until I could recognize that some things had to change in how I was functioning, I was going to continue to drown. It is nobody else's job to fix you. It is your job to fix you. Whether you want the job or not, it is yours. Whether you excel and get promoted in it or you resign, it is yours. It is nobody else's job to fix you. And some of us do that, just waiting and hoping. But it doesn't matter. Because even if you are confronted with the truth of a thing, if you are not ready to make the decision to do something different, it doesn't matter. I told some people the other day, there is a big chasm and gap between knowing and doing. You can know a thing. But baby, get into that doing is a lot. It was not his responsibility or anybody else's to save me. I had to save myself. And when I did, you ever seen no, you ever seen them TV shows where someone's in there and they in the pool and they're like, oh my God, I'm drowning, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. And they're like, uh, ma'am, stand up, you are in the shallow water. <laughs> And that's what I realized. I realized when I stopped doing all this and be like, oh, and panicking and stuff, I was like, oh, this water is like three feet. Let me get my whole entire life. <laughs> you have a choice. <laughs> you have a choice in whether you drown or you float. And some of that comes in being able to trust the water. I haven't learned to swim properly yet. <laughs> I plan to take lessons next year, but I have learned how to float. I have learned how to float. <sighs> and trust that the water will hold me. And for some of us, um, what we have to learn is that your grinding is getting you nowhere faster. 
that you always swimming is getting you nowhere faster. And it actually leaves no space for God to show up. God, you a miracle worker. God, you to this. God, you to that. And God's like, well, if you would just sit down somewhere, I could be the God of something. You let me be the God of nothing because you're too busy trying to be God yourself. And so when I learned that I could rest and things would still happen, that I could take a nap because the do-do list was going to still be there when I, wake, when I woke up, when I learned that I could relax a little bit, and it's, it's not easy. It's a journey. Like, it's an active journey I am currently on right now. But I am learning more and more that the more, the more I trust the water, the things still happen. How you say, oh, nothing that's for you is, is, is going to pass you, and then you're still trying to swim all the time. I mean, dang, if God had to rest on the seventh day, you, you got to rest sometimes. But we don't want to rest in our minds, in our spirits, physically. We just think that we have to keep going. But no, some of us need to change what we are doing. We need to rest. We need better boundaries. We need to stop being in toxic environments. If you hate the job and it's causing you to be miserable, but you still stay there because you think it's your only option, that's the choice. If you stay in the relationship, but it makes you feel like crap every day, but you choose to stay there, that's a choice. It can't be like, oh, why are you causing me to drown? No. We have that work to do. And the water will always carry you if you let it. That was the truth that I had to face. <laughs> that I drowned well and I was responsible for it. That may not be your truth today. But I promise you, if you look around, there is a truth that is trying to confront you. And it may not be a comfortable thing, but listen, we were not called to live a life of comfort. We were called to live the lives we were created to live. And living the life we were created to live, it means that sometimes you have to be uncomfortable. Israelites didn't just get to go into the promised land without having to fight and conquer some giants and some things. So we have to be willing to confront the truths in our lives. What does that look like? If you keep hearing people say the same thing about you, oh, you know, maybe you, you might be a little mean and you like, I am not mean. But like seven people have told you that, like, start with the thing that keeps being a common denominator. If someone keeps telling you something, that is denial, baby. Like to be like, no, 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 because I know better. No, that is when you're operating in honesty, but it is not truth. And sometimes we can't get to those truths on our own. We need to be confronted in some way. Whether that's a situation, my therapist has helped me confront a lot of truths. But in whatever way it comes, just because you don't like how it comes or who it comes. Sometimes, like me, like I said, I was mad for a really long time around that conversation. But when I was able to step back and look at it, I could own my part. And because I could own my part, I could learn how to float and I could evolve. And so there might be some of you here today who feel like you are drowning. You consistently say that you're overwhelmed, you're tired, you're burnt out, you wanna give up, you don't wanna do it anymore, you wish you could go to an island and disappear and lead the kids, That's, I like my kids, I wanna keep them most of the time, you know. If that is you, I'd like you to just come Because the other reality is that if we really do a self-check and an audit of our lives, what we will find is there are also things that we can let go of. You don't have to say yes just because it's your family member. You don't have to do it because, out of guilt. 
You don't have to just keep showing up because other people want you to. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. And it's not just about what you say, it's about your posture. If you are saying yes, but you're really saying no on the inside, that's being double-minded. Be honest. And it is not easy. Because really, when we don't want to stop things, when we don't want to tell people no, when we don't want to do it, it's about acceptance. We don't want to be rejected. And so we, we, we want people to feel like we want them to still love us. But the reality is that you cannot control what someone else does with your boundary. <laughs> if I tell Robert, yo, I, I can't do it, Robert. Why? Because it's not good for me, period. And if he gets mad, I can't control that. And it's actually not my business. That's his problem, not mine. Because I have honored myself. And I wonder how long so many of us are going to dishonor ourselves and keep swimming when there is no land in sight. And you will succumb to the weight of everything. And you know what those people are going to do? Find somebody else to do it. So for you, in this moment, it is about you. Each and every one of you. If you are tired of drowning, if you are tired of being bitter because you are saying yes to everything, if you can't figure out why you can't hear God because you're doing so much, that can change today. Because the life vest in the Savior, wrap your arms around yourself. There's your life vest. There's your Savior. There's your help. It is as far as you can reach your arms around yourself. And it is not easy. It is a journey. But if you keep doing it, it gets easier. And you don't have to worry about taking in water because you can float on your back and enjoy the beauty of the sun. God, we thank you. We no longer want to drown well. We want to float. We want to feel the sun on our faces. We want to enjoy the beauty around us. We don't want to move so fast that we are missing you. We don't want to get so inundated with our to-do list that we cannot find the miracle in the mundane moments. God, some of us just want to do nothing. And sometimes you are offering it to us. It is right there. But we are not choosing to take it. God, right now, we bind our pride that tells us that we can't ask for help or that we're going to look weak or our ego that tells us that we have to do it all. And if somebody else can't do it right or do it the way that we want, so clearly we have to do it ourselves. Forgive us for the ways in which we tried to show up as God in our own lives and relegated you to the sidelines because we thought that we could do it better. Help us, God, to see the ways in our own lives that we don't have to just keep swimming. We deserve abundant life. And abundance doesn't come in constant product productivity in working and moving and going and pleasing and doing. Sometimes it comes in the rest. So in a world that teaches us that rest is reward, let us be reminded that it is requirements. In resistance to a society that tells us that we should not choose ourselves. We love you, God. We are grateful. And it is in your name we pray, amen.
Amen. Amen. I do not stand before you pretending as if I have conquered this <laughs> or that it is easy. Some days you get it and some days you won't. But as long as you just keep trying, I feel like God honors that. Even in doing this sermon, because <laughs> this one was a rough one to get out, and last night, I was tired. I was like, I felt like Jacob wrestling with God. I was like, listen, I'm going I'm, I'm to end up with a limp here. And a friend said, why don't you just go to bed and wake up and try again in the morning? And I was afraid to go to sleep because I was like, I'm going to sleep too long, and then I'm not going to finish the sermon. And I woke up, and I had to change the entire sermon this morning. The entire sermon. But guess what? I got to rest and the sermon got done. And sometimes we just need to see that it's not either or, it's both and. You can rest and get the things. You can rest and still be profitable in your business. You can rest and still do whatever it is that God has called you to. How cruel would it be of God to call you to all these things, but then require you to run yourself in the ground? That's not the God I know. And so some of us need to get past ourselves because God is not in your productivity, God is in the rest. Amen? Amen. 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 Um, God, we thank you. Thank you that you are the God of the rest, that you are the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And we thank you that you set a model for us that yes, we do the work, but yes, we also rest. And because the same DNA that is in you is flowing through us, we have that divine DNA in each and every one of us. And in nature, if the sun rests, then we must if the trees bend and rest, then we must. If everything is based on the circadian rhythm of the, some being awake and going to sleep, then we too must rest, not just physically, but in our minds, in our emotions, and in our spirits, God. And we thank you and we believe that when we rest, when we are willing to confront our truths, you will always, always, always show up for us. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Enjoy your day. <laughs>